Yeah. And I'm sure you've been keeping yourself very uh, busy with your business, My Move Counseling. So you're a trained psychotherapy counselor, if I had that correctly. Um, can you talk to me about your business and, and how you even got into doing it? I can, yeah. I suppose I, I'm, I went back to college as a, as they call it, a mature student a few years ago. And I suppose I would have been an awful lot of jobs. I have a TV at home now here upstairs, and it would be the lint of O'Connell Street in Dublin with various jobs down through the years, you know. And I was never fully kind of happy in anything that I did really in our own jobs and working. And uh, and I suppose the one that I'm in now, it's no, I would see it no different to a nurse or a chippy or a priest. I kind of, I, I felt my calling to it and I followed it and I qualified there a good number of years ago. And, but during that time I was working in Coolbear and Brewery, it's a residential treatment center in Limerick. So I'm kind of hovered there for the last 10 years. And I suppose five years before that, I was up working in uh, the homeless hostel industry inside Limerick with uh, Under Novus McGarry House. And, and I suppose ultimately, I'm still in Coonvera, Coonvera, but I always wanted to kind of tackle something myself. And uh, it, it started there about two and a half months ago, a company called My Move Counseling and Addiction Services with two or three other uh, counselors. And I suppose my drive, my motivation at the time really was, okay, we're in the middle of the COVID. There was an awful lot of people that I was overlapping that were absolutely struggling. Uh, addiction was one side of it, but they were obviously struggling in uh, uh, depression and their moods being low and nothing to do. And so we we started about two and a half months ago, and thankfully it's gone very well. And we're in the process of uh, looking at another unit and uh, starting there all going well in the next two weeks also. And, and, and it's growing all the time, Shane, thank God, you know. And, you know, and there's no point there's no point kidding ourselves. When we're talking about addiction at the moment, I suppose the biggest one that's out at the moment is cocaine. Yeah. And it's, a, it's, it's an issue. It's an issue in every little club. It's an issue in every little village. And uh, I'd imagine somebody knows somebody who's struggling in the line of cocaine at the minute. And the reason I mentioned cocaine because it seems to be the biggest one at the minute. And, you know, even during the lockdown when the pubs were closed, you know, I always say this, you know, there's no bank holidays for addiction. You know, if you want alcohol, you get it. If you want cocaine, you get it. And uh, it was absolutely rampant during the, the lockdown. And, you know, it still is. And I, I'll give you one example of where, of where it's actually gone. And, you know, and I suppose from working in the res residential treatment center, working with a guy who, who would be in there for uh, drugs and alcohol. And, you know, and some of these guys might owe a few pounds to drug dealers. And I suppose usually they'd probably owe to two or three dealers. But in modern time, they're on it to seven or eight or ten drug dealers. So it'll just give you an idea of the scale of it. It isn't going away and it's kind of growing and growing and growing, if anything. But bring it back to my move. Yeah, I, I kind of specialize in addiction and we've other counselors inside it that specialize in bereavement, physical abuse, sexual abuse, depression. So, you know, whatever whatever may present into my move, we have a counselor there that specializes in it, basically. Yeah. Like, it's interesting you, you bring up the cocaine. That certainly is a massive thing. And I was just reading um, an article earlier today. I, I'll just bring it up on screen now. It was, it was one on RT and it was like, the number of people seeking treatment for addiction to crack cocaine in Ireland has surged by 400% in recent years, according to the latest national figures released by the Health Research Board. More women than men are seeking treatment for addiction to the drug. The figures are included in the latest report from the National Drug Treatment Reporting System, which covers a seven-year period from 2014 to... Do you think people are uh, as aware of that? I think everyone anecdotally is aware that it's on the rise and that it is everywhere, but it's quite that bad. And I, I, is it, do you deal with women as well as men? Just even like that figure there saying it's more women is quite striking. Yeah, it is, yeah. And I'm not, I'm not surprised at that. Yeah, and I think an awful lot of people are aware, but I, but I suppose it's kind of a, a bit taboo kind of a subject and not too many people want to kind of, I suppose, speak about it and kind of uh, get real to the amount of damage it is causing for, for smaller people who are actually in addiction. But, you know, the knock-on effect that that has on a family member, whether it's a brother or sister, a mother or a father, you know, it's, it's, it's a destroyer and it does, it does leave devastation 
uh, marks on uh, families as well. So, you know, unfortunately, you know, it's a conversation that needs to be had, number one. And I suppose it's the big the big struggle there was during the lockdown, a lot of the services were closed and, uh, you know, they weren't taking in people because of the COVID. So it probably escalated hugely at that stage, you know. And uh, thankfully, you know, we opened up in the middle of all of that and that's why we were so busy. And uh, as I said, it's growing and growing and uh, long may it continue with that. And what was the tipping point for you to say, I'm going to start my own thing here with, with, with others? Uh, good question. I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm fairly competent at what I do. And when you're working in a residential setting, it's a total different different setting than when you're in the therapeutic relationship and when you're in the one-to-one -one situation. And and I suppose it, it depends on where the individual is at in his addiction. Uh, obviously, there is a line there if you cross it, you know, and it's pretty obvious to kind of whether to kind of assess a person whether they need residential treatment or not. But if you haven't crossed that line, you know, you can do it through the counselling route or through the counselling program and follow uh, an aftercare program as well and follow attend your meetings also. So mm -hmm. there's a few different areas, a few different routes you could go down. And, uh, you know, but as I said, it all depends where the person is at himself or how deep he's in the addiction or how long he's in the in, in addiction. Has it, is it... Generally, are there telltale signs with somebody who's struggling with, you know, something that you might be looking to treat? Or what would you say to people out there if they're worried about somebody and or a person themselves, if they are kind of struggling with, with one of these issues? What's the best way to go about getting in contact with yourself or, or somebody else, whoever's an expert that they, they should probably see? Yeah. And, and I suppose, thankfully, it has been recognized now as a disease and an illness. And, you know, and I suppose it sounds it sounds so simple. And it sounds so easy to verbalize it for someone to reach out for a bit of help. But, you know, w when you're in that, ho that dark hole and you're in the throes of the dep depression and you can't see any way out, it's extremely hard to reach out for a bit of help. So obviously if family members or friends can actually see this. So I, supp I suppose and husbands and wives and sons and daughters, grandfathers and grandmothers, you know, so it's a family disease as well. There's an awful knock-on effect to the family members. So I suppose it's to flatten the person with love and try to support him and guide him down such a route where he can, please God, make a phone call or do one better, make a phone call for the person and take it from there because, you know, the longer one stays in addiction, the more devastating it is and the worse it gets. And, you know, ultimately... Ultimately, Shane, you know, as strong and all as this might sound, I lost count of the amount of people who have died and committed suicide from addiction. And that's the facts and the reality of my last 10 to 15 years experience working in this field. Yeah, because like you certainly would have far more expertise in, in this than I would. But I dealt with or sorry, know people who've suffered through, from alcohol addiction. And, um, you know, there's always this notion or that, that you hear in general that a person reaches rock bottom. But it, like... Rock bottom to some people is actually suicide or, or, you know, something that's terminal, something that, you know, there isn't something to come back from. Rock bottom suggests you'll bounce back, that you'll reach a point and bounce back, but it's not always that way. Yeah, and, and, I, and I suppose my first comment to that, it's the only disease that will tell you that you haven't got it. And, uh, you know, and it'll come at you at every angle and it'll, it'll play tricks with you psychologically. And even if you just take the problem drinker, you know, he'll, he'll do everything in his power to cut back to drinking and he'll want to cut it back. But inevitably, he might do it for a night or two. But it's inevitable it'll get twice as bad again eventually. And, you know, do people have to wait till they go to rock bottom? Certainly not. And, you know, but as I said, it's the big, the big one there is trying to get the person to get him to see that he needs help and to support him and reach out for a bit of help. As I said, it's... It's, it's a very tough one. Addiction is a totally different animal. And, uh, you know, as I said on my, own, on my own Facebook page, you know, it's a killer. It has killed. It's still killing and will continue to kill. The longer one stays caught and trapped in addiction, ultimately, 
that will be the end result. And sometimes it does it slowly, and sometimes, you know, it does it quickly. And one thing I've been interested in is people who are like functioning alcoholics or functioning drug users, that they're actually maybe slowly building a problem. And it seems like to the outside world, they're actually able to, that there isn't really a problem because they're still functioning. So, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that their addiction is any less bad. No, and, you know, I was, uh, I was having a cup of tea there and a sandwich there uh, about two weeks ago outside the shop and I was sitting down having a cup of tea and there was about three or four people about a table away from me and they were all in their early 20s. And uh, it wasn't that I was eavesdropping or anything, but I, I could hear the conversation and it was all coke and tablets and gone out Friday night and Saturday night and the shenanigans and all that goes with it. So I was listening there to that. So do you know what I did as I was leaving? I had a business card in my back pocket. And I turned it down the table and I said, there you go. I said, there's a possibility you might need that in a few years' time or a few months' time. And, you know, when you're starting an experiment in drugs, whether it's at 17, 18, 19, and 20, you know, and things are fine and you're yourself convinced, you know, I haven't a problem. It hasn't got me. But it's inevitable. It's only a matter of time because the longer you do stay engaged in that activity, it's inevitable. It's going to catch you. And like GA clubs are just a reflection of Irish society, uh, you know, just at large. I mean, it's in GA clubs all over Ireland too, or people not within the GA club, but there are people who play GA and are members of clubs all over Ireland that are that are also stuck into tablets, cocaine, whatever it might be. So people, you know, who think that it's just a problem for different parts of the society, that's probably not true. You're you're 110 percent right, Shane, because actually. I have to call, I'm, I'm actually waiting to get a bit of time to call to two different clubs in Clare and to do a workshop in around drug addiction or wellness. And I have two other clubs to call to Limerick. So that will give you an idea that it's rippling through most villages and most parishes in this country. And when I say village and parishes, you know, the street plants, a bit of soccer and a bit of J. And, you know, whether we like it or not, it's part of it. And, you know, it'll stay, it'll stay that way unless we educate them. And I suppose confront it some little bit. And, you know, it might be a popular thing to say, but it's reality. It's real. Uh, I have my finger on the pulse here when it comes to clubs down in Limerick. And I know it's fairly well and truly alive in a lot of clubs and a lot of villages around, the, around Ireland, as I said. And that's, that's the reality of it at the moment, Shane. Yeah, like Limerick gets a bad rep at times. The... Obvious term, Stab City is thrown out an awful lot. Like, I went to college there 20 years ago for a year, so I've, I've heard all of that kind of stuff. Do you think Limerick is any worse than, than anywhere else in Ireland? Not at all. Like, I, when I was saying there, I wouldn't even think, I wouldn't even think of the Stab City. But come here, not at all. Far from it. You know, I'm not going to start blowing in about Limerick. I'm from Limerick, uh, Limerick County all my life. I've been in the city all my life. Yeah. Did they go through a bit of a spell there with certain families? They did. But as a city, is it beautiful? Has it lovely restaurants? Has it lovely scenery? Of course it has. So Limerick is no different. No, the big cities, Shane, really. And and I suppose going back a good number of years ago, 15 or 20 years ago, 15 years ago even, I suppose, you'd be lucky to get a bit of hash out in a, out in a country village. But, you know, they're the villages that I'm talking now is awash with cocaine presently at the moment and tablets. So that'll tell you how far it's after coming in the last 10 to 15 years. And, uh, you know, it has, as I said, you know, the, it doesn't seem to be taking any vacation or going away in any short term. Like, it's alive and, you know, it's an issue. So I'm going to do my little best in confronting it whatever way I can. And as I said, I've done a good few workshops in various clubs already around it. And uh, uh, please, God, I, I have a few more to do. Yeah, and it, do you know what? In some ways, it's probably even less taboo doing cocaine for certain people. It, I don't know if you saw the videos around Euro 2020 final. Like, <clears throat> in the background on Sky Sports News, at one stage, it looks like somebody's taking a sniff of cocaine. There's another video of a crowd of people around somebody, and it's, he's taking a sniff. The whole crowd cheers. So people are getting more blasé about it, too. Yeah, and not only blasé, but I suppose the word I be, the word that's coming to my heart now, they're trying to normalise it and just kind of make it, you know, as, as as if somebody having a cigarette out there should go up and have a line instead of a fag. You're fine with no one, no one really mind. So they're, they're trying to normalise it, and uh, that will be extremely disastrous and dangerous if, if as a nation, that we go down that road. Yeah. But as you say, Jim, 
Yeah, and, and also just ask you about the homelessness. So you've you worked uh, in that area too. It feels to me anecdotally, like I live here close to Dublin city centre, it feels like there are more homeless people than there were previously. Is that the sense you get? Yeah, there is, but in, in fairness to Limerick, uh, uh, the homeless industry inside the city, you know, the amount of the amount of hostels that are in there and, uh, you know, there's a very homeless, there's a great homeless action team in there as well. There's, there's no excuse really for anyone in Limerick City to be homeless. There's so many beds there and there's so many hostels there. And, you know, so if there is someone that's homeless, it's by their own choice and it isn't that they have no place to go. You know, so I think the homeless industry have were kind of, they've looked at that in the last number of years. Okay, uh, seven or eight years ago, you might have had people who were homeless and hadn't got the beds, but there's a huge gap there in the last number of years. There's, there's no real reason or excuse for anybody to be sleeping on the streets in Limerick because the beds are available in, the, in various hostels at the moment. And do you think there's, is there, what, what do you think is the biggest factor or some of the biggest factors around homelessness in Ireland that, well, that people, whether they're going to take refuge in, you know, whatever homeless facility is presented or otherwise, but that people end up in that situation in the first place where they don't have their own, you know, home, their own place of dwelling. Yeah, I suppose th there's a there's a thin line there, really, from someone becoming homeless for someone who has their bed. And if you if you, do, I'm just going to pull this scenario out of the sky. And if you take this typical example of uh, a mother and a father who would, who would have uh, a 19 year old son, and uh, who he, who was, might might have been smoking a bit of hash at 15, 16, 17, and, and on the drink and causing a bit of hassle, and you know has no money, isn't working, and uh, you know, robbing the mother and father uh, to, to buy his drugs and selling the television or whatever. And they're living with that for three to four years. And literally, their hands are tied. They can do no more. And it's ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. And if they put him out, inevitably, he's homeless. And if he then goes into the homeless industry, uh, you're gone to a different level then. How so? So it's do, what do I mean by that is he's he, he's gone living from his own house into a homeless hostel and probably meeting guys similar to himself who might be worse than himself or just starting on the same level as himself. And uh, you know they're going they're going to be living in addiction together. And you know and that's going to be extra hard to try and to cut yourself or to keep yourself separated from addiction you know but there is a thin line there how one can kind of cross over it and and to become homeless you know it doesn't take a whole pile but you know the longer you stay in addiction the greater the chance that you have of becoming homeless eventually yeah and i suppose just to finish up on it then is, is there any f a final point you'd want to make on it or or where do you want to take the my move counseling business yeah and i suppose we're in the infancy of it now at the moment you know and uh, you know we're offering uh, the one-to-ones uh, counseling services and, uh, you know, all going well within the next two weeks, we will be also opening an aftercare uh, group, which we'll be holding once or twice a week. And on top of that, then we hope to be doing uh, family support for family members of the clients and also a recovery group as well. So that's our aim. And uh, we're, we're actually on the train to achieve in that, but it's probably going to take us a lot more time. But presently, at the moment, we're absolutely thrilled and delighted the way it's going. And, uh, you know, but we still have to keep our finger on the pulse and to keep driving it. Hmm. And there's been plenty of positive feedback in as well. Jack Nulty says, great interview. Joe LK20, a Limerick man, I'm sure. Great conversation, gives perspective. And DG, fair play, Kieran. You're a real hero and a brilliant role model for young people. Give up, uh, keep up the good work. So good to be getting in that, uh, that positive feedback. It's obviously touched the nerve with plenty of people, Kieran. Yeah, and, and come here, to be fair, anytime you do speak about addiction, you know, someone knows somebody who is struggling in some shape or some form, whether it is alcohol, whether it is drugs, whether it is eating, whether it's social media, whether it's pornography, or whether it is mobile phones, you know, just the world of them out there at the minute. And, you know, as I said, you know, a lot of people can identify with the conversation we're having. Mm. Okay, well, look, here on Kerry, really appreciate you joining me. Always uh, great stuff to talk to you. So I'm sure we'll chat again soon. So I appreciate that. You're very welcome, Shane. We'll chat again before the All-Ireland, all right? We will indeed. Okay.